a year ago, I made a video about my AW11 MR2. It had very little context. It was only about a minute long and uh, didn't really give much insight into the car itself. I didn't quite know the history on it. And uh, at the time, it was just not, uh, I guess, the right time to make a video on that car. And you can kind of tell how it turned out. The reason that I'm making a video now is because recently the original owner builder of that car actually came forward and told me all the history on it and I just think it's way too interesting not to share with you guys. So starting from the beginning it was a bit of a difficult situation even to find this car in the first place. It was a cryptic ad with no photos very little information and pretty much the only thing you could decipher from it was that it was a 1988 supercharged AW11. It just happened to be posted on a day that I was in the city that it was posted in and uh, that doesn't happen very often. When I finally got down to see the car it was even hard to get around it. It was blocked in on one side by an Opel GT that was converted into a drag car and had a 454 big block Chevy in it and on the other side it was there was a C4 Corvette all around the house as well there were uh, Pontiac Fiero was just surrounding the place the most I had ever seen in my entire life it was uh, it was pretty cool and then just right in the middle in in this two and a half three car garage was the AW11 I started up the car and it went on the first go. I couldn't believe it. Um, I moved it back and forth inside the garage because we couldn't really get it out around the other cars and uh, everything seemed to check out. The only thing actually was that somebody showed up just as I was about to give the guy the money and uh, asked if the car was still for sale. Uh, the guy kind of looked at me and was like, uh, is the car for sale? And I was like, no, nope, I'm, I'm buying it right now. Fast forward to the day I picked up the car, it was snowy and it was icy and I had to take a ferry off of this island in order to pick the car up on the other side. Uh, I was a little bit scared, I'm not going to lie, but um, I had some help from a co-worker who dropped me off on the other side and I hopped in the car, I said a little prayer and I turned the key and it started on the first flick just like it had done uh, a couple of weeks before. I pulled it onto the ferry and a little while later I was home. There wasn't any real drama in between those two times except for, you know, a little bit of fear in my own mind that the car wasn't going to start, even though I had absolutely no reason to believe that. Uh, that is actually where that one minute video that I made uh, came from. And there's, like I said, not really a whole lot of context to that, but there is one part in that video that I do want to mention. Uh, I seem a little bit overly excited in that video that the car has a sunroof. And it's not that I'm a big fan of sunroofs. Matter of fact, I'd prefer if none of my vehicles had them. But uh, supercharged AW11 MR2s in North America only came with T-tops. And I hate, I hate T-tops. Hate them. Despise them. They're just leaky, squeaky little friggin' windows of death. I don't care if you think that they're the most fun things in the world. I hate them and I'm sorry. Anyway about six months after I bought the car I actually sent it home to my parents house to put away in storage and on a couple of occasions I had conversations with my dad where one of us would kind of remark something about the car you know about how it seemed like somebody had a lot of money put into this car but we kind of just brushed it off and said you know people spend crazy money on cars all the time. After the AW11 sat in the garage for months I figured that it would be better off with somebody who could drive the car more often and enjoy it more than I can. So I put it up for sale and one of the first responses I actually received back was from the original builder of this car. Uh, it was built back between 2001 and 2006 and the guy who built it still remembered every little detail uh, about this car. He didn't have a whole lot of photos, which is kind of a bummer. He only had uh, maybe about 10 pictures, but the 10 photos that he has are probably some of the best ones I ever could have asked for. So it was a series of emails and I've broken them down here. So I'm going to be reading from the screen just a little bit. But uh, first of all, the uh, name of the builder, I'm going to keep anonymous. I'll just call him Ryan for the sake of on ambiguity, but he really changed the way that I look at the car now. It's, uh, I don't know 
if I'm going to sell it anytime soon, I don't know what life is going to do, but um, it is a car with a story unlike any other car that I've ever owned. So the first email he sent me, uh, the only remaining photos that he has of the car when he built it, there's probably only around maybe 10 or 12 photos in there. And uh, even though it's not a whole lot, it still gives a really good picture of kind of the car from start to finish. So as the story goes, he first bought the car uh, and it was painted a terrible kind of school bus yellow. The original color was actually white, which uh, I had found out about while owning the car, but it was really nice to actually have somebody confirm that for me. And uh, white wasn't that appealing of a color to him, so the car ended up being painted a uh, Daytona blue, I believe it was called. Uh, the plan back in 2001 was just to uh, take out the original motor and freshen it up and freshen up the rest of the car, and it ended up snowballing into a full gut and refurbish. So the car had professional bodywork and brand new Daytona blue, like I said, paint job, and the rest of the job was actually tackled and completed by Ryan himself. So, uh, like he says, from suspension components, uh, tie rods, end links, bushings, brakes, gas tank, fuel pump, uh, and the list goes on, every single thing was touched. The interior was gutted. On the interior is a liquid sound deadener, and then there's a higher frequency foam deadener on top before adding the carpet. So it was a really intense build right down to the bare metal, and I'll post that photo right here. You'll be able to see that. The most interesting part of the build, of course, was the GZE swap, and it was a meticulous one. The only real uh, telltale signs that this isn't an original GZE car are the sunroof, like I mentioned earlier, and actually the antenna, which the original GZE cars did not come with. Uh, down to the wiring, Ryan didn't stop the insanity when he swapped both the GZE engine and cabin wiring harnesses over, so there's no splice connections in this entire car. And you have to understand that that is like a ridiculous commitment to make, to swap out the entire wiring harnesses instead of just splicing in new connections when they're already there. You have to really be committed to something like that. So the multi-year project concluded in 2006, so it was a five-year project, and the lengthy build, uh, according to Ryan, was due in part mostly to his obsession with finding the best parts that he possibly could. So he was constantly buying parts and then selling them in order to get newer parts or better parts. And uh, that's one thing, like I mentioned earlier, that myself and my dad talked about on many occasions because it, uh, it was something that we noted pretty much from day one. So uh, the first startup of the build was done uh, only after a complete and final check at Toyota, and they were actually the first ones to start the engine. After about a year, Ryan sourced another 4AGZE engine that had lower kilometers and just seemed overall in better condition than the one he had put in, you know, six years earlier. And that engine is still in the car today, 15 years later. As Ryan points out, it all added up to spending more than the car would have originally cost brand new. In 2006, the receipts totaled over 30,000 Canadian dollars, which in today's money is just shy of about $40,000 if you include the new engine that he purchased after all that time. So what do these numbers actually mean? I mean, if you spend thirty or $40,000 on a car, does it actually mean that it's worth that amount of money? Does it mean you could resell it for thirty or forty thousand dollars? And no, of course it doesn't. That's just ridiculous. Do I think the car is worth a lot of money? Absolutely. I think it is above and beyond any other AW11 that I've ever seen. It has been gone through more meticulously than it was from the factory. Essentially, in 2006 was a brand new car. The money you put into a car is rarely what you'll get out of it. The labor that you put into a car can't be charged for, and the parts and the car itself are subject to depreciation over time. What I am certain of is that a car is worth whatever someone is willing to pay for it. I've been told by trolls on the internet that my AW11 isn't worth any more than $7,000. On the flip side of that coin, I've been offered upwards of ten dollars and $11,000 for this AW11 during that short span of time that I had it posted up for sale. I think that whatever somebody's willing to pay for it is case in point with the Toyota Supra like it's behind me. The only thing that I am certain of is that 
I want to see my AW11 in the hands of an owner who's actually going to appreciate it for what it is and how much money was put into that car, how much time was put into that car, and how much effort was put into making that car the best that it could be. Do you have a cool car with a great history? Well, you can follow me on Instagram at Bayshore Boys and send me a message. Let me know all about the car. Leave a comment down below in the comment section. Let me know all about it. I'd love to cover it in a video if possible. And as always, please like and subscribe. If you're new here, my name is Nick and I'm the founder of Bayshore Boys and a car enthusiast from Newfoundland, Canada. I've been into the scene now for a number of years and mostly interested in 80s and 90s Toyotas. I have some really interesting videos coming, uh, even some videos that aren't necessarily about Toyotas but are still about 80s and 90s Japanese cars. I'll also be doing a series very soon about the process of importing a Japanese car from Japan and uh, some of the pros and cons of doing that. So please stay tuned. Uh, there's some interesting content coming, so like and subscribe. Thanks. So guys, this is uh, my supercharged AW11.